Okay, I think we're ready to start. It's really good to see so many people uh, tuning in from so many different places. I'd just like to remind you, uh, when you when you send a message on the chat, if you if you don't change the settings to all panelists and attendees, it's going to be on all panelists and we'll be the only ones receiving a message. Uh, so if you want to share it to everyone else, please make sure to click that button and select all panelists and attendees. Um, and I think maybe uh, we can we can start now. Um, as I'll just introduce myself as the rest of the people join in. So um, hello everyone. My name is Rita. I'm studying. I'm I'm studying in Lisbon. I'm finishing my master's in economics, and uh, I'll be sharing today's session on postgraduate economies. Um, here with me today is Carl, who is the he's he's supervising the tech. So if you have any questions with the technology, try to message him directly. Uh, and Lawrence as well, I don't know if you can see him, but he's the, the Rethinking Economics, he's part of the Rethinking Economics support team. Um, uh, I'll now introduce our speakers. Let me just, okay. Uh, so uh, we have with us today Julie Kim, she's director of the Gross National Happiness Center in Bhutan, which is one of the first countries to prioritize well-being at government level. We have Catherine Trebek, who is advocacy and influencing lead for the well-being economy, which is a global collaboration that aims to transform uh, the economic system into one that delivers human ecological well-being. We have Christoph Gran, who is co-founder and partner of the Zoe Institute, um, which offers consultancy and educational work on transforming economies into individually and socially and ecologically sustainable systems. And last but not least, we have Beth Stratford, who's a fellow at the New Economics Foundation. Uh, the New Economics Foundation has as their main mission to, uh, they've been like helping transform the economy so it works for the people and the planet. Um, before we start, we will each explain what we do um, and in a bit more detail and how it plays into the transition to post-growth economies in just a minute. And after that, we should still have about 30 to 40 minutes to, um, for, for questions, for a Q&A. But before we start, I would like to uh, just quickly go over some simple rules and good practices to make sure that everything runs very smoothly. So as you've seen, you have the chat function activated. It will be activated all throughout. Feel free to use it for like sharing any uh, thoughts, any interesting links that you find. Um, yeah, anything, as I said, uh, if you want to share it to everyone, make sure you're selecting all panelists and attendees as opposed to just all panelists. Uh, for questions, we ask you please to place them in the Q&A section, which is also going to be activated all throughout the session. So you can post the questions as they come to you um, and we'll get back to them at the end of the session. Um, in this Q&A function, you're, you're able to upvote other people's questions as well, which is really helpful for us because it may, it's, a, it's a way to make sure that the questions that are most relevant to you appear on top and we can address those first. Um, and also uh, that you don't, you don't, maybe you don't need to uh, repeat your, a question that's already there if you can just um, get yeah, upvote one. Um, for time management reasons, I'll be reading out your questions. So if you wanna be credited, just make sure that you're correctly identified on Zoom and I'll read out your name with it. Uh, if you're more comfortable, you can also post them anonymously, I believe. So yeah, it's, it's really up to you. Um, and lastly, before we begin, I'd just really like to ask everyone to please keep in mind that we can and we will be able to remove you uh, if you act inappropriately or disrespectfully at any point throughout the session. So without further ado, we can get on to it. So nowadays, um, most countries assess their prosperity by measuring economic growth, which is largely run through GDP, which is a gross domestic product. And while GDP has always been subject to at least some criticism in recent years, what we've actually seen is an increased amount of support for uh, the idea of doing away with economic growth as a measure of success altogether. This happens largely due to the fact or, or the observation that economic affluence of a country often tells us quite little about life satisfaction of its population, at least after a certain point, this, it's, very, it's quite difficult to, to see this correlation between economic success and life satisfaction. Um, 
it also it also um, doesn't doesn't reflect some of the biggest concerns of the general public, such as rising inequality and the climate crisis. In fact, more often than not, it actually contributes to these things. And at the same time, it doesn't necessarily capture some of the most valued attributes of the society. So, like so things like social harmony, political stability, education, freedom of speech, social mobility, natural resources, all that jazz, it often doesn't capture it. Um, so with this in mind, new measures that countries can focus on for assessing their prosperity have been uh, explored recently, both in theory and in practice. So in recent years, we've started to see governments actually stepping up on this question and openly prioritizing well-being over economic growth. So this is what we want to focus on in this panel session. We want to look further into the limitations and the drawbacks of focusing on growth, why it's time to move away from it, focus on other things, and what we can learn from the government and the initiatives that have already taken some steps in deprioritizing growth. So to kick us off, I'll give the word to Catherine. Um, and yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thanks so much, Rita, and thanks to all the Rethinking Economics team. It's always a delight to be part of your events. And it's actually, this is a really lovely um, afternoon for me because it's here chatting with all these uh, Wellbeing Economy Alliance. We all members and folks, just amazing seeing your introductions coming in on the chat, folks from all over the world. I'm in Glasgow where it should be summer, but it's freezing, freezing cold. So if I pull a blanket around me, you'll, you'll know, know why. So much for a Scottish summer, but really, really happy to be here. Uh, we've At the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, we've we're focusing really on articulating and promoting and just celebrating the possibility of an economic system that is not dependent on growth. Uh, but I've been working for almost well, over a decade now and started back in the day with, with Beth really critiquing the idea of GDP as a measure of progress. And we might in the Q&A want to disentangle the GDP question with the growth orientated economic system or growth dependency question. But to me, they are two parts of a much broader question of how our economies are structured and and we see for i mean in nowadays more than ever perhaps that we've got this sort of idea of how do we return post covid how do we get our economies growing faster and faster and we see the political discussion and the solutions being put on the table from sort of mainstream thinkers and and economic advisors and it's got to be about growing the economy because we're, we've almost got this intellectual um, space that is stuck in assuming that the only way to deliver quality of life for people is through growing the economy and perhaps more in, in more enlightened conversations we get a nice adjective put in front of growth so we get uh, low carbon growth or inclusive growth or shared growth I mean it's almost becoming absurd I think it's only a matter of time till we get low fat or organic growth we of course get so often decoupled growth this you know assumption that we can just it will separate uh, the environmental impact with um with you know that will allow us to keep con con continuing on with our, our growth despite all the evidence that it you know won't happen on this sufficient scale or pace that we need regardless you know all rebound effects so we, we we get all these nice adjectives put on growth which just shows i think how intellectually stuck we are in this sense that growth is the only game in town and you can put a nice adjective on it but it has to be growth and that's that is profoundly problematic for so many reasons and beth's going to talk about that in a bit more in detail i think and then we'll hear of some of the ideas of how we can go beyond growth how we can restructure our economic systems and repurpose our politics because we need to do both at the same time we can't have one without the other but i wanted to just share a couple of uh, i guess concepts that my co-author jeremy williams and i and he, he and i published a book last year called the economics of arrival ideas for a grown-up economy and there are three concepts that we found really useful to wrap our heads around a, at least just how the idea of growth has has really run its course in so many so many countries and the first of those is this idea of diminishing marginal returns that all of you who are studying economics will be well used to essentially it's it's a, around the sort of the diminishing marginal utility of more having more and more of something and i was explaining it to my uh, very non-economist brother 
recently and, and he, he's a big fan of cheese and he goes to the, the cheese store at the at the market and has a little taster of it, maybe a camembert or a brie and the first bit of cheese is nice and then it's you know and then he'll try something else a cheddar that's nice and maybe up into three or four tastes of, of cheese that's fantastic you know you're getting more utility um, you're getting more returns from that but very quickly if you keep going the utility the benefit from more and more cheese starts to tail off and actually becomes counterproductive and unhelpful and I mean that's a fairly flippant example but it's that we see this with growth at early stages of economic development whether that's a country or a locality within a country when you don't have enough to meet basic needs and when growth and these are big caveats when growth is used well so when it's used to invest in collective institutions such as health and education and it's when it's directed to those communities that require it. So when it's pro-poor, and Vietnam is a really good example of pro-poor economic growth. So early stages of economic development, more does matter. You do get returns in various dimensions of social progress. The, the reality is though, that they start to tail off, those returns start to diminish. And I, if I was bothering with slides, but it's a Sunday afternoon, so I haven't, you could, we could see all sorts of slides, whether it's a genuine progress indicator report, whether it's a social progress Progress imperative where you see longitudinally or also by country that the returns do tail off in terms of GDP per capita and all various dimensions of social progress. So you get diminishing marginal returns. Perhaps though beyond that, maybe that's a benign way of seeing, see, seeing things. And I think scholars such as Herman Daly, who you know, talks about uneconomic growth, would say diminishing marginal returns is maybe a little bit too gentle. And actually what we're seeing is uneconomic growth. And, and Jeremy and I stumbled across this term that's actually, for anyone who's based in Scotland, will probably be quite familiar. Because in Scottish political circles, we talk a lot about failure demand. This idea that a lot of the demand on the state, on various levels of government, is actually or comes from, has its root cause from our unequal, inhumane economic systems. And so you think about in social policy, so much of what our political discussions and I guess a lot of social justice campaigners work on is trying to find policies to help humanize the current economic system, whether that is top up wages for people who are you know, working for their poverty, who, whose employers are not paying them enough to live on, whether it's remedial education because folks are, are not being, is sort of not having the right start in life, whether it's food banks, there are just so many examples of failure demand. You see it in the security expenditure too. It's been estimated that in the US, for example, well over 5 million people are employed in employed in industries that are described as guard labor, basically defending ourselves because we're, we're scared of each other. And last November, when I was traveling back on the bus through Germany from uh, rethinking, first of all, I think where Rita, you and I met, uh, the bus went past a train station in one of a fairly small German town. And there was a football match on in that town that afternoon and the place was covered in police. There were police just ever really armed up, you know, police ready to go into battle. And, and to me, I was sitting on that bus thinking, what, what a dire indictment on our societies that we have to spend so much money to avert these sorts of riots and, and sort of in, insurrections and violence that comes because we can't have a football match without beating each other up you know, on the streets or in the homes. And all of that some adds up to failure demand. And so it's essentially, it's, it's in social policy terms, the economic fallout, the fiscal price tag on our inhumane economic system. In environmental quarters, uh, ecological economists would talk about defensive expenditure. And again, it's like an onion, so many layers of this. You can think of all the money that's spent cleaning up after an oil spill or my, my home country, Australia, just after the, the bushfires over the last summer, there will be millions and millions and millions of dollars spent rebuilding towns, paying out over time for emergency services, uh, insurance payouts, let alone the catastrophic cost on wildlife and fauna and people's lives. And there is just so much that we spend, which creates a growth imperative. And yet it is actually driven by our failure to create good lives for people. So we have this sort of three-step economic system here, where we, we have this mantra of grow the economy faster, but turn a blind eye 
to the human and environmental collateral damage of that. So that's step one. And then step two is sequester so as much as we can back from that through taxes with all the political machinations and the, that that requires. And we know that greater levels of inequality make those settlements a lot harder to achieve, but then use those taxes to redistribute or to patch up, to heal, to fix, to clean up the damage that we've done in step one. It's an extraordinarily insane, inefficient way of designing our economies and our social policy and our societies. The other aspect, the final point I wanted to make is around this idea of failure, uh, sorry, we've talked about failure demand, talked about diminishing marginal returns. The other point is around pseudo satisfiers, which comes from the brilliant late economist, Manfred Max Neef, where he really recognizes that fundamentally there are universal human needs that we all share, whatever, culture we're in, whatever society we're living in, we just satisfy them in different ways. But he points out really powerfully the extent to which we grasp for what he describes as pseudo satisfiers. And so you can think about our need, very natural need for belonging or for being in, in social, feeling socially included. And we reach for materialistic consumption orientated satisfiers. A, a heartbreaking example um, I saw in the paper last year was in Cardiff in, in Wales here in the UK. Uh, folks who are living rough on the, on the streets, their basic needs for shelter and for safety were being satisfied apparently by being offered stab proof sleeping bags. And it's, it's just an extraordinary indictment on how, how, how much we've lowered our expectations in terms of what we you know, meeting people's real fundamental human needs. But the same it is with, with GDP, we're using GDP as a pseudo satisfier to meet what we really need in terms of quality of life, uh, financial sense of security, relationships, work-life balance, sense of meaning and purpose. And we can't keep reaching for GDP to satisfy those, those human needs because we just don't have the ecological space. And so what the argument that Jeremy and I put forward in the book is that those GDP rich countries that have got plenty of wealth and resources, they need to recognize that they have arrived in the sense that the, they've entered that stage of diminishing marginal returns where failure demand is starting to kick, kick in and their pursuit of more growth is just going to exacerbate those challenges. And what they need to do is recognise that it's time to make themselves at home. And that's a very different economic system. It's one that's purposed around sharing and cherishing those resources much better. So questions around pre-distribution, uh, the circular economy, you know, really different measures of progress, all those questions come into an economy that's making itself at home with the wealth that we've got. We describe that as a well-being economy. It doesn't really matter what words we use. What matters is that it's about social justice on a healthy planet. I will stop there because I want to hear what everyone else has got to say, but really happy to talk about more of that um, in the Q&A and particularly perhaps tell tell you about the wellbeing economy governments initiatives where we're trying to support a couple of governments who are trying to put some of these ideas in, into practice through their own, own political spaces. Thanks, Rita. Thank you. Uh, that was great, Catherine. Thank you. I'll now um, pass over to Beth. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. Um, so yeah, thanks. Also, that was really great, Catherine, to hear your to, to get that introduction and um, thanks for having me. So I, I just kind of, uh, I'm going to offer a brief um, rundown of the content of a briefing that I'm writing right now, which is called The Path to a Donut Shaped Recovery, Donut referring to um, Kate Rayworth's um, model um, for a, an alternative kind of compass to for guiding policymaking, if you like. Um, and so um, if, if, if there's stuff in here which you'd like to see more of um feel free to kind of um buzz me on twitter or something and i'll make sure i can send you the briefing when it's finished um so one of the things that environmentalists um will have noticed uh during the covid 19 crisis is the way that those people who are lobbying for an end to pandemic related restrictions and an end to lockdown early are invoking the specter of 
economic contraction and economic stagnation as part of their argument. And that's, for environmentalists, that's a very familiar argument because it's the, the, the specter of shrinking, uh, you know, uh, if a shrinking economy or a stagnating economy, uh, slowing growth that has been invoked again and again and again by people to oppose environmental protections and to oppose climate policy over the last few decades. So, and it's been, it's been invoked very successfully because many policymakers are frightened about uh, slowing growth. And the reason that they're frightened of it is because our current economy is dependent on growth to maintain financial and political stability. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, kind of four ways that that growth dependency uh, expresses itself and then four opportunities that we have as part of the recovery from COVID-19 to address those growth dependencies. Um, so let me just share my screen right now. Share screen, desktop, share. Hope you can see that. Um, on that. Uh, so, oh, damn, this side is now. So I'm just having a little um, technical issue with my screens because I can't. Yes, we can see it clearly. Okay. So the, yeah, it's all it's there in front of us. Can you still see it? Now I've got the one with the ball and chain. Oh, that's annoying. Um, so, Whatever you had up before had the four dependencies. Yeah. New share. Oh, it's disappeared. This is really frustrating. Um, whew, okay, can you, can you see the four dependencies now? Okay, yeah. I'm not going to try and expand it because it seems like that screws everything up. So, um, so basically, there's four things going on here. First, it, there's a risk of debt crises. So we're dependent on growth for economic stability because our economy is heavily burdened with debt. Debts are promises to pay based on expectations about the future, usually income growth uh, or asset price growth. And if those expectations turn out to be wrong, then debt obligations become really dangerously destructive. So unlike equity investments that would shrink or grow with the fortunes of the firm, debts are fixed in nominal terms. And if the interest can't be paid, then they grow exponentially. So high levels of indebtedness for various reasons can transform like a modest fall in expected growth rates into a full blown economic crisis. So that's the first expression of our growth dependency. The second is the threat of unemployment. So the reason that we're dependent on growth to maintain employment is because of weak labor rights primarily. So in the short term, weak labor rights lead to an explosion of unemployment under conditions of economic shock, as we've seen with the pandemic. But even in the long term, poor bargaining power among workers actually gets in the way of us maintaining employment in the long term. Let me explain why. So automation and innovations that gradually reduce the need for labor um, would end up delivering uh, um, surplus labor, unemployment over time, because we need fewer people to make the same amount of stuff. And conventional economic wisdom tells us that consumption growth is the best way to soak up that spare uh, labor. But if workers were actually re remunerated you know, fairly, um, and were, were, uh, were, were, were working in sort of more democratic workplaces, then there'd be an alternative way to maintain employment. Rather than expanding our consumption, we could reduce and redistribute working hours. So instead of consuming ever more resources, we could take the benefits of that automation and that mechanization as increased leisure time. So like a four day week, for example. I hope that makes sense. Um, the third sort of expression of our growth dependency is, is the iniquity that arises from rent extraction. So we're, we're dependent on growth basically to protect the privileges of landlords, monopoly interests, other rentiers. These are people who don't create wealth, they extract the wealth that other people create um, through their control of monopolized and scarce resources. Now, as long as the rate of growth is higher, then the rate of rent extraction, and it's steadily higher, 
then that situation can can be masked it can continue it can be kind of tolerated to some degree but as soon as wealth creation stalls as we've seen with this pandemic wealth creation stalls but but those uh, rentier interests continue to extract wealth then the result is going to obviously be rising inequality and people push towards destitution um, and then finally a final expression of our growth dependency is is the sort of failure of our systems of provision to satisfy to safeguard basic needs so because you know if you think about it natural resources like land and energy and and, and, and forests um, and fish and so on are common resources that we could design our systems to ensure that everybody has a basic level of access to those resources that we depend upon for our survival but instead we've allowed those uh, resources to be privatized and then sold back to us um, so the system that we have is that essential goods and services like housing social care energy transport are rationed by your ability to pay essentially so the ability of the very poorest to meet their basic needs is going to be threatened by a fall in income or by a, a rise in prices incidentally which is why it's so difficult to bring in carbon taxes that we need because the ability of the very poorest in society is going to be compromised um, because their carbon footprints reflect not luxury consumption, but consumption to meet very basic needs. Um, so those are kind of four expressions of our, our growth dependency that make our economy and society vulnerable to contractions in economic activity, um, such as we're experiencing now with the pandemic. And that lack of resilience in our system makes, it, it impedes our ability to respond effectively to public, not just public health emergencies, but ecological uh, emergencies. Um, I can't actually see what the time is because of the way my computer screen is working. Um, how much longer can I talk for, Rita? Because I wanted to run through um, some ways that we could s respond to those vulnerabilities and try and reduce them as part of our recovery from COVID. Uh, yeah, I think you still have a couple of minutes. So if couple you can, if, okay. yeah. So um, yeah, basically we want to be in a situation where if there are forms of economic activity that pose a threat to our health and well-being, we need our policymakers to be confident to take action without triggering debt crises or unemployment crises or inequality or, or destitution. And that confidence can only be achieved if we tackle these sources of growth dependence. And the good news is that the current crisis kind of does present an opportunity to, to tackle those, highlight and tackle those vulnerabilities head on. So with debt crises, I mean, there's a lot to say here, but just a few headlines like with, with debt crises, compared to the financial, the global financial crisis, the coronavirus crisis, I think has featured a more informed discussion now about the role that central bank money creation, the, the state's own power of money creation could play in reducing public and private debt. So lots of, you know, mainstream economists are now publicly dismissing the scaremongering around hyperinflation that has been used to block monetary financing in the past. So that's one thing we know there's an opportunity to highlight the, the, the problem of irresponsible bank lending and bringing re regulations to control that. There's an opportunity to highlight the, the benefits of shifting from debt financing towards equity financing and changes in our tax system to support that. Empowering workers. I mean, the, the pandemic has created this newfound appreciation, right, for, for workers who keep society ticking and, and a kind of indignation about the low pay and the precarious conditions that many of them face. So there's an opportunity now to push for a pay rise for essential workers to extend and restore collective bargaining rights, to, to strengthen the social security net that is so essential to give workers the, the confidence to, to assert their rights in the workplace. Um, there's more I can obviously say about that. We also have an opportunity to to create well-paid, high-quality jobs as part of the jobs as part of the green recovery package. Um, and then, with those kind of shifts underway, it becomes much more plausible to use reduced working hours as a strategy for maintaining employment, even while we reduce our consumption. Um, tackling the power of landlords. Um, there's a lot that I could say here, but with rent arrears mounting now and an evictions crisis looming, I think there's there's widespread support for for tackling the power of landlords, basically, and strengthening the power of renters. Um, and also, you know, in, in terms of taxing back 
monopoly profits and uh, rentier incomes. There's the, a couple of economists in the US, Sayers and Zuckman, who've noted that a, an excess profits tax has actually been brought in several times in moments of crisis over the last century to precisely to make sure that no one can benefit outrageously from a situation in which the masses are suffering. So in 1918, all profits above an 8% uh, return were deemed abnormal and were taxed at really high rates of, of 80%, up to 80%. And then finally, um, you know, that the, we could sh ensure that the rents that flow from control of our common resources are socialized and used to guarantee that everybody in society can meet their basic needs. So, for example, now with customers struggling to pay utility bills, there's a, there's a powerful case for introducing a new tariff system in which customers are entitled to a certain number of energy units entirely free of charge. And then tariffs attached to energy use at higher levels can be, can be increased to, to, to discourage really profligate, wasteful uses of energy without compromising the ability of people to meet basic energy needs. Again, that, you know, with the, in, the, in the wake of extensive public support for transport companies in the wake of COVID-19, there's an opportunity to reimagine our transport system, introduce free bus travel and so on. Um, anyway, I'm conscious of not wanting to take up more time, so I'll, I'll stop there. But yeah, the, 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 the bottom line is really that um, if we can kind of shed the blinkers of, of GDP maximization and instead focus on what matters for well-being and for, for long-term well-being and sustaining the, the Earth systems we depend on, then we actually give ourselves more freedom. This is not about foreclosing the possibility of green growth, but it's about opening up room for maneuver and, and ensuring that we can prioritize health and well-being um, over simply uh, growth for growth's sake. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. Um, yeah, thank you. That was really great. I will, yeah, I'll uh, pass over to Christoph. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I was, I tried to share my screen. Can you see it? Cool. Um, hello, and it's very nice to be here with all of you and um, great round, great arguments already from Catherine and, uh, and Beth. And I can connect to that with the project we've been working on at Zoe uh, in the last two years, where we were working together with policymakers from the European Commission mainly uh, on finding out how can we make the argument digestible, the argument of opening this room for Minerva, for finding a way of combining social justice uh, on a healthy planet. And this is also why the, the project's name is uh, a bit uh, Eurocentristic. I am fully aware of that. Uh, nevertheless, you can find many, many ideas and inspiration, I think, on that homepage. And um, to move beyond GDP, it is very important to have a new compass to understand in which direction we'd like to go. And I would like to walk a bit through this homepage, and I'm pretty sure you can explore many more things also if you're an economist or a teacher or whatever in university feel free to, to yeah, work with what we developed here in the last two years if you look at the story behind um, trying to understand what we need um, we also worked uh, with kate rayworth she's uh, part of of the advisory board of zoe and the new compass we're working with or looking at it combines on one hand the ecological stability which, which means we want to find policies that help us to stay within the planetary boundaries so if you wish you could discover some policies i, I will not go i mean let's just click it and uh, you would come to the to the heart of the, the home page which is a database where you can sort all kinds of different policies according to different goals. I mean, we, we have three different goals. We're not talking about growth or non-growth or anything. We're just skipping the goal away from GDP and growth to live within ecological ceiling, uh, have a stable economy independent of growth and the social foundations uh, that are insured. I will come back to this data. Just again, we have the ecological stability we want to ensure. 
We have the social resilience, which would be the inner part of Kate Rayworth's donut. If you hadn't had the chance to look at it, please check it out. It's brilliant, the book from Kate and all her approach being used in real life. It's not just a theoretical book. It's, for example, being used by the city of Amsterdam currently and many more cities to find a way to, to have a living and thriving city, country, whatever. So we have the ecological ceiling, we have the social resilience, and of course we need some economic stability, which means we have to move uh, towards this independency, as Beth was talking about. And um, certainly we have these barriers and we, we put them all here. If you have time, check them out. So we have, whenever you talk to somebody, they would say, yes, but we have to stick to growth because we're dependent on that. Okay, so look at them. We have employment and income. We have positional consumption, efficiency consumption, and so on and so on. We have six or seven different uh, um, dependencies named here. So if you want to look at employment and income, then learn how to ensure stable employment and income independent of economic growth. You can click here or, or you can go directly go to the database, which you find here with the, with the policies. So you have these three goals of ecological ceiling, stable economy and social foundation. And to achieve these goals, we need some transformative action. In this case, we want to ensure stable employment and income independent of growth. Uh, we have different goals, right? Uh, transformative actions. Uh, for example, improve the conditions and quality of informal work or promote the commons based allocation and so on. Just check it out. In this case, we're talking about employment. So what, what would we do to ensure the stable employment? So we have all these different actions. We could decrease working time. We could redefine the extents of benefits from social security. We could increase self-production and subsistence work and so on, different uh, strategies to achieve this goal. But certainly policymakers would want some more concrete action. So let's have a look, decrease working time. What would that mean? So these are the policies which would help you. Um, for example, working time reduction or tax benefits for employee cooperatives and so on, four days work week. Yeah, so you can have a description here of the four day work week. We have the source this time from Friends of the Earth and so on. Working time reduction, same here. What would that mean, okay? So this would be part of these uh, growth dependencies, but still you can walk through this database for a couple of hours or days. We worked two years on that, so take your time and check out these uh, um, different policies. For example, you're interested in the goal of uh, ecological ceiling. So it's all the green things here, which would mean ecological ceiling. For example, position well-being and sustainability as the ultimate goal of economic decision-making. Okay, which interestingly enough would also meet the social foundation and the stable economy goal. So what we're trying to work on is to find policies that would open up the room to achieve different goals at the same time. So ideally we would have uh, policies that would meet social and ecological goals at the same time. And this could be um, whatever, just check it out. Um, so this was just a short introduction to the database, but there's more on this homepage. Um, because you will always meet people who would say, yes, but they would say, it's a good idea that you have this all this database, but we have all these counter arguments. Then you can go to this evidence part and compare some arguments. So it's basically, a, we call it a reflection game. There's still more to come until now we only have three different uh, idea, like, uh, yeah, sentences that have some idea behind it. For example, the growing economy can be dematerialized Renewable energies will decarbonize the economy at a sufficient speed. 
technological innovation will sufficiently decouple resource use and economic growth through increased efficiency. So you can ask yourself, is that true? Is that really a good argument? If you're not sure, just deep into it, go into it, dive into it. So uh, it's because there's a positive efficiency trend, but then you can go through the buts. Efficiency, gain, efficiency gains do not decouple sufficiently. And you can walk through this argument and read it and compare and talk to others. You can go to the next argument and so on. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a teacher at university as well, and uh, in the next semester I will have a course on macroeconomics of degrowth or post-growth, whatever. And I will certainly use that homepage. There is uh, some ways to walk, uh, long ways to walk there. And uh, last but not least, um, this project is just the beginning for us. And we're very happy to share it with anybody. We're very happy to include you as partners, as people who have been studying this or work, working on this for many years. Just contact us, contact me and bring in your research, your arguments, your data, your policies, whatever. And uh, we're happy to, to grow this database, not to infinitely, but at least there's more potential at the moment. And then one day it will be fine. It will be a good database everybody can use and uh, we can work with that. And so contact us, be part of it and join us. We will also put it on Exploring Economics. And uh, you probably know, if not, check it out, exploring-economics.de uh, or org or whatever, I don't know. And it's a great collection of uh, economic alternatives and yeah so far from my side and thank you very much for your attention and i'm looking forward to the debate thank you thank you christoph uh now we have julia kim to um present to us uh, and then we'll move on to q a um thank you for all the questions we've had a lot of submissions and they're really good so yeah keep up thank you Thank you, Rita. Hi, everyone. It's a really pleasure to join this group, and I'm also learning a lot from all our previous speakers. I want to uh, pick up on some of the themes that have come up already in relation to um, uh, going beyond GDP, growth beyond GDP, and share some experiences from a country in the Himalayas that some of you may have heard of, um, Bhutan, in relation to an experiment, uh, a real approach that they're testing on the ground there called gross national happiness. And uh, just to confess right up front, I'm not an economist and I, I never thought I would need to understand so much about e e economics. You know, I've been working in the public health field for many years, um, focusing on HIV, gender inequalities, <clears throat> poverty alleviation, at one point working at UIDP in New York. And it became very obvious to me that to address these larger issues of just how we live our lives and how is our health, I had to understand more about economics and I had to understand what are some of the root causes driving the situations uh, that we've been hearing about earlier. So um, I want to share a few slides now that will talk a little bit about um, how Bhutan has come to feature in this kind of a dialogue around uh, going beyond growth. And um, maybe to start with talking a bit about how GNH began, began in the country. So really beginning with uh, the vision of the king, uh, the fourth king who, when asked by a reporter, what is the gross national product of Bhutan back in the 1970s, instead of giving a number, he came up with this brilliant quote, which is that uh, in Bhutan, gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. So really putting it out there that as the country was beginning to open up to the world, to develop, <clears throat> to become more of the, part of the global community, their priority was that they would grow in such a way that happiness and well-being of people would be the priority, not just bringing this number up as quickly as possible. And it's uh, very interesting that around the same time, Senator Robert Kennedy, uh, who was on the campaign trail in 1968, gave a speech uh, which, in which he criticized uh, gross national product. It's on YouTube. It's really worth seeing if anyone's interested, and it's very timely for right now. And he basically summarized it by saying GNP measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. So uh, quite a 
extraordinary statement. Um, so I think Catherine and others uh, touched a little bit on our obsession with growth and you know how did GDP get to be the target and the be and be all, end all and be all of, of growth. Um, so we know that in the 1940s coming out of the Great Depression GNP and what we now call GDP was adopted by the IMF and the World Bank and at that time it had a good functionality you know help predict fluctuations in in the growth but it was never intended to be a kind of reflection of how well a country is doing like the gold star GDP stamp um, or a sense of progress or success or good life and even Simon Kuznets who came up with the formula never intended to be used that way so if someone asks you what are the problems uh, with GDP you can summarize it quite simply with three things what it counts what it fails to count and what it hides so what it counts is only marketed economic activity, regardless of what the outcome of that is. And we heard some brilliant examples from our earlier speakers. You know, if you cut down forests, if you're trying to patch back after devastating fires in Australia, GDP goes up regardless of the fact of the huge human and environmental devastation. Um, it does, what it fails to count are many of the things that we really enjoy as human beings, the things that thrive. Um, maybe the things that, as Catherine was referring to, in contrast to the um, pseudo-satisfiers, the things that really do satisfy us, and that's uh, not always marketed and it's not always counted in GDP. So unpaid childcare, uh, spending time with our family and friends, being in a park that is open to the public and is not asking you to pay a ticket to get in, all of these things are, are not counted, even though they contribute very much to our sense of well-being and happiness. And what it hides, I think some of our speakers alluded to already, whether that growth is even or not, and the rising inequality uh, that goes underneath that GDP curve. So some brilliant books up there for people who are interested in learning more about that. And then, um, as somebody alluded to earlier, wealthier countries are not necessarily happier. So up to a certain point, uh, growth of the economy does meet basic needs and that's important but as GDP continues to go up well-being and happiness as measured in surveys doesn't accompany that so this is a, a graph of the United States comparing life happiness or life satisfaction uh, uh, versus GDP growth per capita between 1972 and 2016 and you can see <clears throat> in the blue line that GDP is per capita is continuing to go up but life satisfaction remains more or less the same and is starting to decline. So um, the World Happiness Report from 2012 looked at many different countries and asked what beyond incremental growth of GDP matters more to people. And there are things like community trust, good governance, so the feeling that the government is uh, trustworthy, has the interests of people in mind, whether people are participating in elections, how much corruption is there, that really matters to people. Meaningful and secure work, we heard a lot about that from our previous speakers, really important now in a time of COVID, not just having a job, but will that job be secure and is it meaningful or is it just getting up to, to turn, turn the, the millstone? And work-life balance. So these are the things that I think we can relate to in the countries that, as Catherine was saying, have made it, have now, you know, they're the champions in terms of GDP so what, what has been lost in that chase towards uh, growth? So people often ask me, what do you mean by happiness when you talk about gross national happiness? Because it can sound like such a fluffy word. Um, and I love this quote from the first Prime Minister of Bhutan who brought the idea of GNH to the UN in 2012 at a high level meeting. And it's quite a profound definition. He's, he's putting it in contrast to just the moods that go up and down during a day, which clearly are not the basis for making government decisions. And he said, true abiding happiness, true lasting happiness can't exist while others suffer and it comes only from serving others, living in harmony with nature and realizing our innate wisdom. So he's really talking about uh, happiness as not just being an individual thing. It's very much interconnected in terms of our relationships with others and our connection to nature and also our connection to ourself. So meaning, purpose, a good life, a sense of being well in yourself. These are things that are, are seen as very important um, in terms of uh, gross national happiness. 
so a little bit about the measurements. Uh, Bhutan is trying to measure how they're doing in creating an enabling environment for happiness. So while a government can't force you to be happy or ensure that you're happy, they can create the enabling conditions. And their survey, um, which is undertaken every three years or so, looks at nine different domains or areas uh, that they measure to get a sense of whether they're creating this environment. So three of them are pretty standard that you would see in many uh, development uh, surveys. They include living standards, education, and health. Everybody would agree those are fundamental bu building blocks for people to be well. Um, but it also includes uh, it's, uh, measuring their uh, impact on the environment, environmental awareness, how are they doing in terms of balancing that domain, community vitality, so something around uh, our social connection. Do we uh, know our neighbors? Do we trust our neighbors? How much crime is there? Uh, time use. So again, we were talking about work-life balance. It's actually a lot more than that, but you, you, it's called time use. Uh, psychological well-being, really important. We've been seeing the impact of COVID on uh, community psychological well-being, our resilience to stress. Good governance, I mentioned earlier, cultural diversity and resilience. All of these are seen as important um, things to measure and create an enabling environment. And what you'll notice is that there are both tangible and intangible dimensions of well-being. So things that were you, if you were not to measure them, could easily be ignored. Psychological well-being, time use, right? How do you see these things in the system? So again, the importance of measures in making visible things that we might otherwise not see and which would therefore not be within the remit of policymakers. That's the importance of, of new measurements. So when we speak about gross national happiness, we also talk about uh, the inner conditions for happiness. So certainly addressing structural and systems um, aspects are really important, but we would also say that the inner condition of the human being is also important. And um, we all know people who have um, a wealth of uh, material assets and um, all the kinds of um, uh, securities that you would wish, but are still very unhappy. And conversely, we know people who have very little are managed to be really resilient and positive in the midst of that. So that suggests that there's some balance of the inner and outer that is going on. So what's interesting is um, that sort of uh, neuroscientists, uh, psychologists are starting to find that we have a capacity to cultivate happiness or well-being skills. Um, for those who are interested, um, the science of meditation, a really good summary of some of that research, focusing on neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to be trained and adapt so that um, uh, present moment awareness, mindfulness, resilience, the ability to sustain positive emotions, rebound from negative emotions can be cultivated. And um, as Dr. Richard Davidson from the Wiseman Brain Institute has said, uh, exercising our minds should be approached in the same way we exercise our bodies. So we all think about fitness, going to the gym, weightlifting. We know that our ability to be physically strong isn't just embedded in our DNA. There's things we can do to, to improve that. Same with our ability to cultivate this resilience and happiness skills. Similarly, a lot of the social science research is looking at things like compassion, altruism, volunteering, these kinds of pro-social behaviors that we've seen come up during a crisis like COVID-19. Also show that there's support the physical, psychological, and collective aspects of well-being, not just the, of the person who's uh, doing the good things out there, but of the, uh, of the society as a whole. So it's, it's kind of uh, has a, a knock-on effect. And so these have important implications for education and community interventions so that we're not just patching up all the time with more social interventions to um, help people once they've been devastated by the system, but we build up that kind of uh, resilience uh, so that people can um, actually have a more positive um, ability to be well and to be happy. So a bit about how it's applied in Bhutan. <clears throat> It's important to start with the vision. And the fifth king, the current king, has said it's development with values, not just development for its own sake. What are those values? You need to be able to measure them. So the nine domains, as I mentioned, in the survey that's undertaken every three years, Center for Boudin Studies and GNH Research does that. 
And then you need to be able to put it into policy. It can't just sort of sit on the shelf as a nice research report that's collecting dust. So there's a GNH commission, which is like the planning commission in a country. And they have a GNH screening tool, which they use to guide and assess policies. So if you want to um, open up uh, a mine in Bhutan, they would look at what will be the impact, not just on jobs and finances, but on education, health, psychological well-being, uh, culture, all those domains that I mentioned earlier, and then ask um, how can it be improved if it's actually having a negative impact in some of those domains. And finally, all this can seem very top-down uh, if it's not actually embedded within civil society and if it's not actually something that's lived and breathed. So the GNH Center, which is the NGO which I'm working with, are, are really focusing on how do we apply this vision uh, and practice in daily life. And we do this through different approaches um, around leadership development, working in partnership with uh, business, uh, education, and youth programs, uh, different ways of making this uh, real. So um, maybe to speak a little bit more about um, that aspect of what we're doing, really we uh, try as much as possible to look at the example of Bhutan, uh, not just going as a tourist, but really speaking to local es experts, immersing them in the culture, and um, nature and speaking to people to understand how is teenage actually being applied in the country. Uh, we try to also bring in some element of transformative leadership. So in order for people to be able to move towards a new paradigm and to have some confidence in the importance of new measures, we have to in some way unpack and demystify economics. So to have people go through a process of learning, you know, and unlearning a lot of our assumptions about the economy and cultivate the sources of well-being and resilience in themselves so that they have the courage to go out and try adapting, practicing, and prototyping this in different contexts. So in many countries, um, uh, there are so many different communities and contexts for this. Can we bring these values and new measurements into a community level, into a city level, into an organization, into a school, so that people can start to see some of these more intangible aspects of well-being and understand why they're important and why they need to be prioritized by government. And for those who are interested in learning a bit more, we're um, launching one program uh, that's going to be starting in November online. Uh, we're starting it online because of COVID and travel restrictions. Uh, and then we hope to bring the group to Bhutan in April, um, travel allowing, and then to reconvene in Canada in August of 2021. And within that time, period, people will be adapting, practicing these beyond GDP approaches and sharing their insights with each other. So much in the way of uh, previous speakers trying to build up a community of practice around these issues and uh, build out the network so that it becomes really a, a social movement as well as an individual practice uh, towards greater happiness and well-being. So I think I'll stop there because uh, I'm sure we have some uh, great questions for all of our speakers, but thanks so much um, for allowing me to uh, join in with this uh, amazing group this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, all the interventions were really, were really good, and I've been checking the questions, and they're really interesting. So yeah, please keep upvoting them and typing anything new. Uh, and maybe we can we can get on to them actually. So the first question is about. Um, so I guess Julie just just um, answered this a tiny bit about the gross national uh, happiness index in particular. But the question is um, how stable the alternatives to GDP that don't focus on growth are. So um, considering that they often try to correlate uh, uh, incommensurable. Um, uh, things like happiness and health and justice, and that they they are forced to sort of arbitrarily include things, uh, some things and not others. How how can we find a suitable alternative to GDP quickly enough to start applying it? Uh, and the question is not addressed to anyone. So um, if anyone wants to answer that, just feel free. I'm happy to chip in, but I think others others will have. I have questions as well, or oh, uh, something to co contribute to that as well. Um, 
yeah, good question. I think the, the beyond GDP world has been described as the, the wild west of, of measurement, that there are so many new indicators and new measurements and new indices being produced almost daily. And, and I have to confess being a bit frustrated uh, by, by new measures because not all of them survey the terrain and say, where's the gap that that requires us to add value. It, it's just, well, it's, it, it's an it index is an exciting project. Let's, you'll get some headlines, let's launch it. And so there's so many new measures coming out. I think it's probably cluttering the space and confusing policymakers quite a bit. They all have their different niches. They, they speak um, to different issues more than the other. Some are more environmentally orientated, some are more development orientated, some are more, more sort of community orientated. The ones I gravitate to are those that have got participation at their heart, partly um, pragmatically because they're, they're ones that are much more likely, I think, to get political traction because you can say this has come from voices of communities. Uh, this has come from you know, voters. You can have that conversation with, with politicians. But more, more importantly, there is something prefigurative um, about creating participation in new measure of progress. I think if we're going to have a chance in transforming the economic system, we need to talk about power and changing the balance of power. And at the moment, uh, a lot of the beyond GDP measurements that are entirely awesome, most of them are really well intentioned, created by people who have got uh, really, you know, you know, meaning well, but they're often created by people who are elites, uh, who are sitting in very well-resourced university uh, corridors and have, yeah, well-intentioned, but not necessarily, they don't represent, they got, don't constitute a turning of the tables of power. And I think if we're going to replace GDP or, or complement it or go beyond it, we need to do so in a way that puts participation of communities. Um, so I'm a big fan of those that take the time to be to have deliberative consultation at their at their heart the thing is though communities have fairly similar priorities when you give folks a chance to sit down and talk to each other and with each other about what matters you will come up with fairly similar um similar similar answers about what matters you know as, as max neef has discovered these are fundamentally universal needs uh they would differ in emphasis and differ in how we satisfy them. But I think the point of, of going to communities first really, really matters. Um, so I'll stop there because others, others will have, have views. But I think that's part of you know, building the political demand for this is, is having these start in communities rather than start in, in the corridors of power. Yeah, maybe just one quick argument. Uh, I don't think the aim should be to have one new indicator to substitute GDP and just have this other one being the great indicator. And I, I really recommend to read the, the project I just put in the chat. It's from New Economics Foundation and others. It's the Brain Pool project about how to bring alternative indi indicators into the policy process. And I'm fully 100% with Catherine that it's about participating. It's about, we had some really good experience with the European Commission where we have uh, policy labs together with the policymakers, and we're not coming from outside and telling them, okay, this is the new indicator, you would have to use this one. It's about connecting with their experience, with their daily work and, and inspire them and, and, and take them on the journey to, to some, some other indicators. And, and certainly, I mean, we're here at the Rethinking Festival. I mean, you, you know about one big, problem of having other indicators it's economic theory and all of us have been fighting to change economic theory for many years and i think we're in a good way i think uh, looking at economics at some universities at least uh, it's not that easy anymore to just preach the good old way of what economics should be and should not be and we've been some we've done some good work in the last years all of us and delivering a new narrative, a new story that people can lean into, that people can inspire with. And, and I think what Catherine has been doing the last years and Kate and Tim Jackson and all of these great people, opening a new world, a new story and going and not having this, this is GDP, this is bad and not talking to the past, just forget it. Just open a new world and talk about it, be inspired and 
it shouldn't be about, okay, but we can't do this in one year or in one month or in two or three years. It's not the question. We will not manage to replace GDP in one month. As, I mean, we should have replaced it 30 years ago. So it's just about going on the way and yeah, find solutions. And I think Kate Rayworth is a good ex example of also finding different solutions for different layers. I mean, the city of Amsterdam would have a different solution than the Scottish government, which would have a different solution than, I don't know, any region in Chile or in, in India or whatever. You know, it's, it's about finding a proper fitting solution. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Beth, Julia, would you, would you like to chip in or uh, do you think that's covered? I'd rather mo uh, cover more questions because okay. I know there's lots more. Yeah, there but. is. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, the next question is about um, how uh, companies, like multinationals in specific, as well as governments, have interests in, in this growth-focused um, approach. And the question is, what happens when transitioning towards sustainability and post-growth ideas are, are going against business interests? And how can businesses be swayed to change their current methods? From Sarah Thornton. I could offer a few words on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, we, we, there's no doubt that we have a, a big struggle on our hands, you know. Um, there are very powerful interests that benefit from the status quo. Um, I think that there are lots and lots and lots of small and medium-sized businesses, however, who suffer because of the way the current system works and the way that big extractive uh, interests um, um, Finance, financiers extracting wealth out of the system, monopoly interests extracting uh, farm, you know, t undercutting the small producers, um, the landowners extracting rent from underneath uh, businesses. Um, so there's, I think there's a lot of common ground actually among small and medium sized businesses um, uh, that can, we, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of scope for building alliances basically. Um, and I think, yeah, we just have to focus on the fact that all of the, you know, um, all of the, 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 the sort of structural changes that, that I discussed there um, to end our dependence on growth are like powerfully emancipatory for the majority of people. So yes, they offend the interests of a small group, but there's no the only way to 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 overcome that is by kind of a process of um, uh, building solidarity, building power, building you know um, awareness, and building a sense of agency among the the vast majority of people who would benefit from a shift away from the current extract system of extraction. Sorry, that's probably. I don't know if that's a, as detailed an answer as you'd hope for. Just build on Beth's point, just, just quickly, um, just really, really briefly. I mean, this is a, this is a topic we should dedicate a couple of hours to at least. One is there, there are businesses and there are businesses, right? So Beth talked about the size in terms of small to medium enterprises that aren't always led by the, the growth imperatives that are much more rooted in their communities. But there's also this emerging, what's been described as the emerging fourth sector of a whole wide range of different business models that are using commercial viability, using exchange, but not for the sake of extracting profit up to remote shareholders. And so there's this whole plurality of different forms, uh, I'd say probably on a spectrum in terms of how, um, how radical and revolutionary and transformative they are, right through, we've got on the one end, say the, the B Corp movement, right through to the economy for the common good. Um, in the middle, you've got social enterprises and co-ops and, and community interest companies and all sorts of different business forms where people are still, uh, they're commercially successful, but that's not the point. They're using commercial activities and business activities to deliver social and environmental uh, benefits, how, I mean, however defined and described. And there's a conversation we could have about the democratic issues there and accountability issues. But there are, I think there is a huge role for businesses constructed in that way, transformed business models that have social and environmental 
uh, purpose as a part of their DNA in, in a wellbeing economy. So I, I think that's part of it. The other point is that businesses will respond to the incentives. And, and so if we create a different um, operating context through taxes and incentives and subsidies and so on that make it in make it worthwhile for businesses even the big businesses to transform and to, to move in a certain direction they will move a lot of them will kick and scream and do the best they can to underpin and, and you know resist that legislation but they they will respond and so i think we need to look at using the the levers of taxes particularly to create different incentive systems and so for example how do we price um you know how do we take into account externalities how do we develop full cost accounting for example how do we shift the tax base away from the per head of worker, perhaps to hours of work. So then you move away from working a fewer number of staff, long, long, long hours, to having more staff working fewer hours, you know, towards a sort of shared working week, you know, short work time reduction. So there's lots that can be done to make it worth the while for businesses to, to move. I think the question perhaps even beyond businesses is vested interests and the confluence of wealth and power through political capture, um, which is a huge thing I'm just going to throw out there and shut up so that other people can, can come in. But I think that's something we need to really pay attention to. Maybe I'll just add a little bit here, um, just picking up what uh, Catherine and Beth were saying. You know, I feel like uh, there's a lot of um, interesting research showing out, showing up now, and I point people to the spirit level as a great uh, compilation of that, that is showing how inequality is not just bad for the poor, which is obviously a no-brainer, but how it's also bad for the wealthy. And you could think about rising crime rates, living in kind of high security complexes, environmental devastation hits everybody. So to the extent that, because um, there's also a lot of fear that's holding up the current system and, an, and, a, and a desire to not change. So to get through that, how can we use both data and intellect and the kind of inner transformation leadership, leadership aspects I was talking about earlier, so that those who are ready to try something new in a business have the courage and the, and the moral support to be able to go forward and there are companies and business leaders who are doing that and beyond that the larger ecosystem um, so for example a nod to well-being economies uh, the government aspect uh, supporting countries that are trying to go in a different direction New Zealand you know Scotland Iceland Wales all these countries uh, that Catherine could speak to who are trying to uh, fly against that current and then within that context, governments have more uh, scope in which to innovate. So I think that's that, again, the inner aspect, uh, the, the getting past the fear, using the data. So even if it's uh, still, still self-interest of business, it's a more self-aware, a more enlightened self-interest that in order for us to be able to survive as a business community on a fragile planet, we have to start taking action. And that uh, happiness and well-being, a well-being economy isn't a zero-sum game. If somebody else is benefiting and there's more well-being and happiness in the community, doesn't mean that there's less for me. In fact, the opposite. So I think there's that kind of paradigm shift, the narrative change, using research, using examples, and having countries that are supported to moving forward. All those are really important. Thank you. Uh, should we move on to the next question? Or, Christopher, would you like to say anything? Um, maybe just quickly towards uh, or half a minute. Um, I mean, it's not GDP only. It's uh, there's so many different aspects of going beyond GDP. As Catherine mentioned already, it's about power concentration. It's about value chains and all this. And um, my impression is that the time is changing currently. I mean, there's uh, a lot of more open ears, and at least in the in the European Union where we have some context and even one or two years ago, I mean, with Fridays for Future, bringing the, the topic on the plate and then bringing the debates there, I think there's an, a window of opportunity now to, to raise these questions. And um, so it's, it's also about bringing the questions to the right people and uh, having good arguments and, and we should, get rid of this one, this thought in our mind that we need one other number. It's, 
doesn't that help us? <laughs> Thank you. So the next question is, is it's about degrowth, which is often more heard of in public debate, and it's the um, it's Lea Gupil is asking uh, how uh, degrowth is different from the post growth approaches. That you're muted, but yeah, you can go for okay, it. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, it's a really good question. And I c obviously, I can't speak for all people who sit under the label of degrowth or post growth. But so, the reason that I personally um, use the label post growth is because sometimes I think with the label degrowth, it um, gives the impression that um, they're replacing one fetish, which is a fetish to always increase growth with another fetish, which is to always decrease growth. Um, what matters obviously is, is um, our impact on the environment, the rate of resource extraction, the, uh, you know, the habitat destruction and so on. So I would be, so I tend to um, frame things rather as we know what we need less of, we need less of environmental destruction and we know various measures that could constrain, that could, um, that could provide those, that protection. We then need to know, be prepared for the impact of, of those environmental protections on our economy. And if, as eco ecological economists um, believe, um, those environmental protections are very likely to constrain growth, we need to prepare to adapt to that. We need our economy to still be resilient in the face of that uh, constraint in, on growth. And that's why, for me, it makes much more sense to focus on ending our growth dependency rather than ending um, rather than shutting down anything that could facilitate growth, right? Because some of the things that facilitate growth are like cheap energy or like innovation. Um, in, the right, in the right structures and in the right context, innovation and cheap energy could be useful to us, could have social benefits because they could free us up to spend less time working and more time caring for each other and more time clearing up all of the mess that's been created by 40 years of neoliberalism. So, um, yeah. Uh, Can I add, add to I'll that? Um, <laughs> and, and that's, I entirely, entirely agree with what Beth said there. And I think there's also just to uh, add a bit more to the, I guess, the tactical aspect. I, the analysis underpinning the degrowth agenda, I, I entirely agree with. I mean, it is so, so sound and we need to promote it um, more, than, more than is being done. And it, it's really great to see the traction, the attention it's getting. The, the challenge is, is that we don't have time for cre sort of creating antagonism. What we, and and the, a lot of the proponents of degrowth talk about is how it's a, it's a missile word. And I, I, to be honest, I don't think we have time for missiles. I think what we need is bridges and tables where people can sit around. And it's much easier for me as someone who tries to work with governments to shift the policy regime to be invited into a conversation with a civil servant uh, to be taken seriously by political actors when I'm talking about something positive that we want to move towards in, you know, in a well-being economy uh, rather than a term that, that is deliberately constructed to be a missile term, even though I completely understand uh, the energy and the impetus and the the why the term is used um i think if we're if we're wanting to try to really move the policy regime i think we have to sort of talk about what we're for uh so so that's and, and just my experience um is working with governments is that that that's more it, to be positive and constructive is more useful but I, we absolutely need to hang on to the analysis that informs the degrowth movement that's really really vital um i'll i'll stop there but there's lots of more i can say it's Okay. Um, yeah, I think that was that was very clear. Thank you. Uh, the next question is um, how developing countries can be able to determine when their post growth measures should start. Like, how what's the the line between uh, we should aim at growing and we can now start, uh, start focusing on other things and abandon our uh, obsession with growth. I think that's it. And this is from Daniela Jimenez. Should I start on, on that and then pass to others? I think Beth's point really speaks to that really nicely because we shouldn't be thinking, is it 
is it post growth or growth and then abandon it? We should be growth. Growth in itself is a really abstract term. Uh, what we need to be identifying is what do we need more of? What do we need less of in a certain context? And in in countries that uh, uh, when we say developing, we're meaning what lower GDP per capita, uh, but countries that are not yet able to meet basic basic needs from citizens, they will need more growth probably in that that sense of the term but what we need to be really mindful of is what it is used for what it is being how it is being created who's getting the benefits of that growth and we've seen countries such as nigeria over the last few decades where they had rising gdp per capita at the same time as poverty rising or you look at a country like vietnam that was very concertedly pro poor in its economic development and so they were able to ensure that the benefits of growth went to those who need it most i think we see at a I was talking about earlier you see the returns on growth come when we use growth to invest in collective institutions like health and education but there will come a point where growth is actually putting more demands on our health systems for, for example through you know this inhumane unequal economic system that creates health inequalities and creates people reaching for those pseudo satisfiers like drugs and alcohol because their financial precariousness and lack of meaning you know actually ends up adding through failure demand to the demands on those collective institutions i think there's a the conversation one around utilizing uh, local knowledge that's already there. There is no correlation between wisdom and GDP per capita in how to design the economy. And a lot of the really great examples that we've already heard from Bhutan come from countries that do not sit in the G7, the G20. They come from countries that recognize that a good life is not dependent on faster, faster GDP growth, whether it's Buen Vivir uh, or, sort of, or the sort of post-growth radical ecological uh, development that we're seeing merging in India. There are so many good examples that show that we should be utilizing that. I do like the idea of taking the concept of leapfrogging and applying it beyond just low carbon infrastructure. Could, for example, countries cut to the chase and build Co a cooperative rich economy rather than economy that's filled with businesses that are about extracting wealth up to remote shareholders? Could they design tax systems so that they incentivize those different business models? Could they have pre-distribution built in from the beginning rather than going on that three-step journey that I talked about earlier? Uh, but I do think a lot of the onus of this conversation has to be in the the in rich industrialized countries because they're the ones that are eating up all the ecological room that are not giving our cousins in the in the majority world the ecological space to increase their material living standards that is their that is their right uh, stop there again for others i mean still uh any time is a good time to look for a social and ecological objectives, right? I mean, you can't expect just by focusing on GDP to reach your social and ecological goals by, them, by itself. And so I think any time is good to focus on, on social and ecological goals and try to reach them. And then, as Catherine said, with countries with a low GDP, we probably expect the GDP to to grow, I mean, then it's, but it's still the point. We're not focusing on GDP and then hope that something good will come out of this, but focus on your goals and objectives and then GDP grows or does not grow. I mean, and um, it's probably rather a problem of, of, and that's all over the world, the problem, I guess, it's of the elites being in power who have a different agenda than uh, normal people, I would say. So it's, it's, the same questions all over the planet. How can we make a transition to social and ecological objectives with people in power who are not capable or able or willing to do so? And yeah. Thank you. Uh, Beth and Julie, I don't know if you would like to add anything to that. Um, I think that question has been answered really well. That's the main side. Okay. Uh, so the next question I have here is uh, asking about um, governments that are currently making any efforts to shift to a well-being economy. 
such as New Zealand, um, and also asking about the differences between the ones that publicize it proudly and um, the, the things that, that, that seem like, like you're sort of embarrassed of and trying to hide it, like the UK's NHS funding of wellbeing programs. Um, so yeah, like which countries or which governments are making active efforts and how are they uh, talking about it and how are the reactions and everything, if you could comment on that. This is addressed to Catherine, but I think if anyone I feel like I've talked in the Q&A, but maybe Julia could talk about some of the stuff that's happening in, in Canada and talk about some of the stuff that's happening in, in Germany and I can follow up at the end with a tiny bit about we go, but I, I don't want to dominate the, the Q&A. I think I've already spoken more than my fair share. You're being too modest, Catherine. I think it's, uh, <clears throat> I think it's always a, a dangerous thing to stick your head out, out of the crowd. And I think most governments and policymakers know that. So there's something valuable to quietly doing the work before you start flying the flag. Um, and I think there are more countries than the ones we've listed who are doing that. I think there's also countries who have been doing the right things but don't necessarily put themselves out as being a happiness or well-being uh, economy. You know, some of the Scandinavian countries have been making really great progress um, based on their principles and philosophies and moving in that direction anyway. Um, I think uh, I think that uh, the important part is, is connecting it to the grassroots, as people were saying, because we know that political cycles change every four or five years. So uh, somebody can jump on that bandwagon and say, this is what our government is doing and it sounds great and it gets media coverage, but underneath nothing's really changed. It's just been painted over with a, a well-being brush um, so that's where uh, the kinds of conversations we're having now, uh, shifting the way economics is being taught, which I think is a big part of this festival, taking economics out of this box, this mystery, this black box, so that ordinary people understand what does it have to do to me? That influences the way people vote. It becomes part of the narrative that we're creating a well-being economy. Um, so that I spoke about Bhutan um, in Canada, which is uh, where I am at the moment. Um, there's a lot of interesting work uh, happening here um, in one of our eastern provinces in Nova Scotia. Uh, they're taking a well-being approach. They've just done a, a quality of life survey. Uh, it's called Engage Nova Scotia. And I think eight areas that they're focusing on, quite similar to Bhutan's nine domains, and finding uh, very interesting things that people value as part of uh, a good life uh, that are different from just economic growth. And um, they're going to be using that to kind of inform how Nova Scotia starts to move out of the COVID pandemic. Um, David Suzuki Foundation, uh, a, a major environmental champion in, in Canada, has now um, uh, opened up part of their work to be looking at well-being economics. So not the first th thought that you would think an environmental organization looking at well-being economics, but clearly they've made that link and they already have a, a, a very powerful reputation in the country. People trust them. They're doing work on, on the environment and on sustainability. Now looking at well-being, looking at the social aspects. So I think those are, are important uh, first steps. And I think starting, starting with the actual work rather than making big proclamations is probably a good way to go. Beth, Catherine, anybody else want to join? Catherine, why don't you pick it up? Okay, so so the I'll say a bit about we we go, which is Wellbeing Economy Governments Partnership, and this is a a, a, a group of governments that is essentially want to collaborate to try to learn from each other to put these sorts of questions into and put collective well-being at the heart of economic policy making. And so it's a little bit like a community of practice. Uh, so the, it's started by Scotland, joined by New Zealand, Iceland, Wales, and we hope a few other governments will come on board in the, in the coming months. So we're talking a lot to other, other governments. And it's not about perfection because none of them have delivered it. It's about saying we want, we want to go on this journey together and we need all the help we can get. Uh, and we need to learn from each other and share and uh, share challenges and, and common, common uh, concerns and other you know, different governments are 
making the headway in different aspects of this agenda. Uh, so I'm really excited about it for that. I'm also excited though about the spotlight it shines on different ways of seeing success because as, as Julie I think said, it's really hard to go this alone. And when so much of the global geopolitical groupings and where the power flows are to clubs where the entry ticket is literally how big is your GDP, G7, G20, you know, even the BRICS, the only commonality the BRICS had is that their GDP was per capita was rising at a similar pace for a certain period of time. We need, we need new champions in this era of you know, environmental breakdown and inequality and you know, SDG era. We need new champions. And I think the, it's perhaps no coincidence that innovation along these lines happens in small countries. So we're trying to nurture and support these governments and, and also give them all the encouragement they can get because they will be bolder when they know the citizens are demanding this. And so we're also trying to sort of build the community and the, the grassroots up demand and support for these sorts of policies. And it's, it takes place in terms of um, wellbeing frameworks, different purposes for, um, for what government is about, moving away from GDP, bringing in new measures, uh, incentivizing the sort of business models that we were talking about earlier, putting, asking more in terms of businesses operating in government, uh, changing taxes, you know, moving away from downstream amelioration to prevention. There's so many, so, such a plethora of things these governments need to be doing. But if you, if you define the purpose differently, all those conversations come, come after it. Hence why I think the Beyond GDP conversation is one of the most important ones because it opens up all these other, other conversations about how to get there. Um, happy to, I'll, I'll try and dig out the link and put it, put it in, the, in the chat for a bit more about WeGo. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we're just running out of time, so I'm just going to wrap up really quickly. But um, I hope everyone enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, the questions were amazing, so thank you so very much to everyone who chipped in. And obviously, special thanks to our panelists for the fabulous insight. Uh, I think most of the links that were shared throughout the session can be found on the website and uh, any links that were added throughout the question, I'll try to download them and maybe add them to the website later if possible. Um, likewise, the whole session was streamed on Facebook, so you can go back to it and watch it or you can recommend it to someone else. You could, I think it's also going to be added to the website, so there's that as well. Um, just some final words. Don't. Um, don't miss out on the last plenary. So today's the last day of the festival. There's only one more session and it's, the, it's happening in, I think, 30 minutes. And it's on, is, econo is an economics degree useful in a post-pandemic world? So I think the link will be added to the chat soon. Um, as well as the link to a Facebook group where we're continuing our discussions. So you can join that as well. Uh, and finally, Rethinking Economics is conducting a survey on how economics has related to the pandemic and uh, responded to it appropriately or not. So it would be really, really appreciated if you could uh, fill that out. Shouldn't take very long. Uh, and I think that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, I think this was, I had a really good time. I think this is all very interesting. So yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rita. Bye everyone. Yeah, Thanks, bye. Rita. Thanks, everyone. It was a real pleasure. Bye. Take care. Thank you, folks. Uh, bye. Bye-bye.